Let's bow together as we enter into this time now of prayer. Oh, Father, we come before your throne this morning, so grateful that we come before the kind of God that we just sang about from your word, these ideas of who you are that have been given to us with certainty from you. Lord, that we know you're a God who cares for us day by day, whose attentions are on his children because of love. And so, Lord, we come before you this morning in our sickness, in our sorrowing, and in our suffering. We seek, Lord, your strength and your healing and your comfort. We put our hope together and for each other in you, O God. You are the God who has declared himself to be full of steadfast love that never ceases. The God who brings to us mercies that never end, that are refreshed every morning, whose faithfulness is greater than our unfaithfulness, greater than everything for us. You, O oh Lord, are our portion, and therefore our souls say to you, we will hope in you. You are our help. You are our strength. Because you cannot fail us, we trust in you. We pray, O oh God, for those in our church who are suffering loss now. Well, there, are, um, there is depth of loss in our midst. We pray, O oh God, for comfort. We pray for strength and provision. We strength for wisdom. We pray for hope. We pray, O oh God, that you would guide us as a congregation into fruitfulness in your kingdom that you would bring many people in Terre Haute and around the world to saving faith in Jesus through the light and the witness of World Gospel Church and through our individual lives and conversations. We pray, O oh God, that your name would be magnified through us. And now, O oh God, as we approach your word, we do so humbly. We do so approaching it, Lord, with the expectation of hearing your authoritative voice to us. And we come, O oh God, as those who have have entered into relationship with you by faith, with submission to your word and eager desire to be obedient. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. If you would take your Bible and open to the book of James, we're going to be continuing our series there. Many thanks to Eric for bringing the word last week. It's an important word on first fruits, and uh, we're blessed by that. As you may have heard, um, Last week uh, in service, Craig Reynolds and I, along with Pastor Brett Park and Dr. Schuld, Mark Schuld from Valley Church, which was formerly known as First Baptist Church North, I got to get used to the name change, we went with Faith Baptist Mission on a trip to Nicaragua, and there we met a remarkable pastor, and we met a mentor of pastors, um, we identified a village uh, to which we may pursue a partnership with, just like we did with Pelewala and Sierra Leone. And uh, that would lead, hopefully, by God's grace, to a number of fruitful short-term trips from our church going to serve there. And Craig and I will present our findings to the Elder Council for approval and then to the GO Committee. And we're trusting God to lead next in our direction. But whatever direction... We go, we were tremendously encouraged by the people that we met there, made some sweet gospel connections that I hope will lead to fruitful ministry in the future. And if you would join us in prayer that God would guide and lead in this, both at Valley Church and at World Gospel, that we would have a clear sense of how he is directing, uh, that would be a beautiful thing. So we, we uh, seek your prayer to join ours in that. Well, this morning, as we turn our attention to this morning's passage in James, I have a question for you. I wonder if you have ever attempted to do something in your life for which, without completion, there's no achievement. It's not like weightlifting, where if you have some goal in mind that if you never get there and you've lifted a bunch of weights, you've gotten stronger and it's been a good process, it's more less like a, a garden that you're hoping to get maximum production out of, but you still have some delicious produce if you don't get there. It's more like making it to the moon. Either you get there or you don't. And if you don't get there, there's just a whole lot of empty space in between uh, for you to lose everything in the atmosphere. 
But when you do make it to the moon, well, hey, there's a reason to celebrate. After all that planning and testing, those trial runs and huge investment, it was worth it all, right? Now, if you remember back two weeks ago to our first sermon in James, James has introduced to us the topic of trials. We talked about how we can start to feel like in the middle of trials that God has abandoned us or that our suffering is pointless or that we can't bear up underneath it. But James called us to count joy in every trial because God is unstoppably adding things to us by strengthening us for steadfastness. Now, James is still on the same topic today, though it may appear as we read that he's covering a few separate ones. Remember back, James, who is the Lord's brother, is writing to his scattered flock of Hebrew believers, and they're facing trials that are attended with oppression and poverty and danger. And they needed courage and wisdom in order to stoke their faith so that they could endure. So this wise pastor is going to serve them up the goods that they need on a platter. He's going to bring the Old Testament and the teaching of Jesus into an integrated, focused beam of truth that will help them meet their need. And as we'll see, meet our needs too for endurance. So let's read together. We're going to start with these first three verses, but continue through verse 18 eventually. James 1, 9 through 11. James writes, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, in the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also the rich man, so also will also the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits." We're going to see this morning is this, that living in light of death and the character of God propels people to persevere through the trials of life and to, to persevere to life. So we're going to look at that in two, two movements. One, we're supposed to live in the light of death. And two, we, are supposed, we will persevere through trials to inherit life. Apparently, whoever put together that PowerPoint... <clears throat> He may, he may be present at the moment. Put point two as point, point one as point two. So that's point one, in case you're confused. Believers have struggled without, throughout time with prosperity for some people and not for others, right? Especially the prosperity of the wicked. If you read through Psalm 37 or 73, interestingly, it's just flip the, flip the uh, numbers around and you get the same topic. Believers can get to thinking, God, what's the point? How is it that I'm faithfully following you and I'm poor and this guy over here is faithfully following you and he's rich? Or even worse, how is it, God, that I'm faithfully following you and I'm poor and the guy who is opposing you and doing wicked gets richer and richer? So believers start noticing the glitter of gold a little bit more. And the orientation turns from God towards stuff toward the house or toward the money or toward the car or whatever it is. And that somehow becomes the object of our affection. What becomes, what should be nothing becomes to us a God, little g. And James has something to say to us. He's told us to pray for wisdom. And now God is giving us wisdom, how to evaluate life in light of who God is. And he says this, that this matter of exaltation is something we need to think through. The universal reality of death breaks our paradigm of privilege. Lowly brothers, Christians who are poor, who have low social status, right? They must boast, it's a command, to rejoice and declare exaltation in their poverty. Elevated brothers, Christians with high social status and and abundant financial means, must boast in the fact that all of that means nothing and they are humiliated. James isn't saying that that our social or financial statuses will change in this life. He's saying that there's a bigger truth that undoes all of our small-minded disparities and gives us a picture to see it. It's a picture of the grass and the flowers that the grass produces. Everyone is like grass, right? Grass that just covers everything. But a few of us are like flowers, bright and shiny and special, like the rich person. And so he tells us that the poor and the rich alike are equal. 
We stand on equal ground because the wealth of the rich is an illusion. They aren't established and secure like they appear. They're headed for exactly the same passage through death as the poor. When the dry season hits, all the grass gets brown and all the flowers of the grass fall off too. We were just in Nicaragua last week and it was the dry season and there was lots of dead grass around. It's not very pretty, but every season, this is what happens, right? The sun toasts it all. So the grass and the flower die together. So he says that the rich man also will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Job said, naked you come in and naked you go out. Riches don't stop you from dying. The rich guy dies while he's pursuing more of them. And he doesn't get a first class journey from there beyond, right? He doesn't take anything with him. There's no privilege. Psalm 49, 16 through 17 says, Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. So the promise of wealth ultimately comes up empty. And the poverty of the poor doesn't end in their humiliation. The poor are exalted to the same place that the rich are reduced to. Riches are a mirage and are an illusion of exaltation and privilege. You can hear the words of Jesus being echoed here again, can't you? Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And whoever uh, exalts himself will be humbled, Matthew 23, 12. Jesus isn't giving us some sort of secret rich, uh, formula for getting rich. Jesus is teaching us what matters and wealth and importance aren't on the list. It's God's justice that matters and that what makes things right, not power and wealth. And so Jeremiah tells us what we should be boasting about and what really matters. In Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24, he writes this, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For the, in these things I delight, declares the Lord. What he's saying is, is that delight in this, that you know the God who is life, the God who is riches, the God who is security, the God who alone holds in his hand the privileges of his blessing. And so he reminds us that riches are temporary and fragile. They expire instantly in the big pictures of God's plan in eternity. So if blessings aren't wealth and privilege, if that whole paradigm is like shooting for the moon but coming up short and flaming out, where is real blessing? Where's the mark that we are supposed to be headed toward? Well, James is glad you asked that question because he answers it in verses 12 and following. He says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So James reorients us. He says the blessings of life are not found in wealth and privilege. Blessedness is found in inheriting the crown of life. Persevering through difficulty and through hardship and through doubt and through temptation to find and lay hold on eternity. Verse 12 says that this is the man who is blessed because he receives the crown of life. Now James is picking up the thread that he began in verse two when he started talking about counting it joy when you face trials of various kinds. 
We're supposed to count those things as joy or joy in each one of those things because that enriches us in some way. So the trial can be an experience or an enticement, something that is external or internal. And so he's talking about circumstances still here, but he's finishing the thought more fully. Of course, suffering produces steadfastness, but what's the point of steadfastness? Steadfastness is what makes us so that we endure to the end, so that in faith we lay hold on eternal life, this crown of life. This is our ultimate salvation. It's what is beyond the, the death that we all face. And he gives us an image, the image of a runner who is trained and trained through exhausting and a painful regimen of running the race of his life with one goal, to get across that finish line. There's a victory and celebration. There's blessing where he's headed. It's interesting that he reserves the crown of life for those who get over the finish line, isn't it? We might be concerned here that James is preaching a works-based salvation. Maybe he doesn't understand his brother's teaching after all. Or maybe he disagrees with Paul somehow. But as we'll see, James is already telling us that this is a test of faith. Faith is that one thing that is not a work. We're saying, God, I don't have it. I need you. I need salvation. I need your grace and your gift for me. Jesus has called, up, called us to take up our crosses and follow him, the path to death, the path of hardship, but ultimately to victory. And that's just why people who truly trust Jesus will stick with Jesus. People who love wealth and ease and privilege will give up on Jesus, just like a runner who's running a race but decides he wants ice cream instead and never finishes. Like scientists who settle for some sort of pretty looking rocket that never makes it to the moon. James is focusing us on the moment of our judgment, the time of our death, not on our immediate experiences. He's saying, stick with Jesus. Finish the race with Jesus. That's where blessedness is. That's where the crown of life is. That transcends our feelings. That gives us true security. That is true riches. Persevere past the cross to the crown, just as Jesus did. John 3.36 said, whoever believes in the Son has life, eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. The wrath of God abides on him. That puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? It's not just a matter of whether or not I have a moment of ease or a hit of temptation with pleasure. It's whether or not I'm headed toward life. It's who I really love. It's where my allegiance lies. It's where my goal is. What I really believe about life and sin and things. Giving up on God. Casting God aside. That's what unbelievers do. So God's leading us toward life. And he'll keep his promise to us. Revelation 2.10 says this. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Paul, when writing to Timothy at the end of his life, said these words in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Perseverance in faith is what it means to trust Jesus as Savior. And even though that's true, continuing to trust Jesus isn't a good work that we employ to earn salvation. Faith itself is the antithesis of seeking personal merit. Peter describes this idea more clearly in 1 Peter 1, 5. He says that believers are they who, by God's power, not personal effort, by God's power are being guarded through faith 
for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. God strengthens and secures believers and believers respond in trusting him. We return trust in response to God's power. And so for believers, there's a crown of eternal life ahead for us. Now you may still have a doubt nagging in your head. What about a God who would allow all of this hardship to come in the first place? Can't he just stop all the trials? They seem so strong. The temptation seems so real to me. It seems as though I'm not strong enough to bear up underneath that. Well, I'm sure James, again, would be glad that you asked this question. Look with me as we proceed further. We've read already 13 through 15 in about this temptation. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. James is focusing on these external circumstances of difficulty and now he's moving it to what happens on the inside of us, this internal enticement to sin that can accompany our trials and our tests. And he focuses on, on something that is, is true. The danger of hard times lies within us, not outside of us. We can't blame God. He's not evil. God's not attracted to evil. Now this verse contains two no ones. It says no one can blame God for an enticement to sin because God entices no one to sin. James grounds this emphatically in the character of God and the Greek word order and, and, and placement helps us to understand, understand that he's kind of trying to emphasize this loud and clear. God is untemptable. There's nothing inside of God that, that entices him to want evil or to do evil. And because he doesn't want evil or do evil, he doesn't do things to us to make us want evil or do evil. There's a principle at work here that's very important for us to grasp if we're going to understand who God is, that though we are made in God's image, we must be careful to not place back on God a perspective that includes our own brokenness and sinfulness. We are so soaked in our susceptibility to sin, to give in to sin, to make excuses that the temptation was too great for me, that we assume God has the same kind of struggle, that lurking in his heart is some dark place that eventually could give in, but there's nothing like that in God. And so James says God is perfect and he brings out a mirror for us and he moves it from the general to the specific. He says each person, we desire evil and that's why we're susceptible to it. Each one's own desire for what is evil is excited so that despite initial reluctance, the Greek word has the idea of we're dragged away into sinfulness. We've taken the bait because we wanted it. Verse 15 gives us a picture of birth. Our own desire locks onto a sinful opportunity, conceives, and then gives birth to sin. And sin, in the end, brings forth what? Pleasure? Happiness? Fulfillment? Success? No, it brings us death. And God has said that he is leading us to life. There is no way he would tempt us to something that would lead to our death. So instead, God does exactly the opposite. And he has an entirely opposite kind of birthing experience for us. Verses 16 and following. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Isn't that beautiful? In love. 
God has moved to give us life. And James renews his earnest and tender entreaties toward his beloved brothers, he says. Listen, beloved brothers, that's not who God is. This is who God is. And he commands them to believe what is true. He says, do not be deceived. There's a lie in the back of the mind of every person that haunts us. When we're tempted... And the lie is that because we're evil, not because God's evil, that he's like that too. There's a constant need for vigilance lest the shadows of our ignorance darken our image of God, of who God is with doubt. If there's a lie that will keep us from enduring to the crown of life, it will be that lie that God's withholding something good from us because he's really not good. It's the same lie that, that they experienced in the garden and believed. We hear it in our pop culture right now in some really strange ways. There's a, a line of, of, uh, of thought that's presenting Satan and Eve as the heroes in the garden and God as the enemy. And somehow Satan and Eve were smart enough to disobey God so they could persevere through to find out what's true and good. And out of jealousy, God cast Satan to hell. Now that's just pure, unadulterated Satanism, right? That's just Satan flipping the script and causing us to give in to our doubts on who God might be. But that is blasphemous deceit. James helps us by painting a picture of who God really is. He gives us a practical theology to hold on to so that we can fix in our minds and hearts who God is. His true character, his behavior, his intentions. God gives life and good because God is unchangeably good. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. This is a pointed and emphatic contrast to the charge that God brings hardship on people to defeat them through temptation. No, God gives and this is grace. He gives every good and every perfect thing. Here we find the word perfect again. This is this theme in James that we see coming up over and over again. The wholeness of what's right. We're called to be wholly trusting in God because God is wholly good. God is using various trials to equip faithful believers with steadfastness so that we are made perfect and complete. And he's a father, the father of lights. Isn't that interesting? He's not the piggy bank of lights, the genie of lights. He's the father of lights. Reminds us of Jesus' teaching that we looked at two weeks ago, that he, he, better than a good father on earth, delights in giving good things to his children and to those who ask him. And so he says the father is also the father of light. God is light. This speaks of God's holiness and his purity and power. He's the creator of everything light and good and he is brightness and goodness himself. 1 John 1.5 said, this is the message that we have heard and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That means that light and goodness and generosity reside absolutely and immutably or unchangeably within the person of God for eternity that can't change ever. He does not change ever. The picture in verse 17 of no shadow of variation due to change is the idea of the constellations and the sun and moon crossing our sky and that the lights are changing and it's getting dark and it's getting light and things are different all the time. He's saying, no, that God's not like that. God is invariably and therefore eternally generous, luminous, and life-giving. And that's the last part, verse 18. It was by God's will that he brought us to spiritual life through the word of truth. He's telling us something. God's not giving birth to death. God's giving birth to people who are alive. 
We get to thinking because we wrestle with our decision to follow Jesus and receive him as savior, that it's our will that enables salvation. But James lifts our heads from our downward gaze to fix us on the will that brought us forth by the word of truth, which is the gospel. It's God's will that came up with the entire salvation plan. It's God's will that he offer it freely to all who believe. And it's God who moved toward us to give us life, to enable and enact all of this within us. And so this redirects us back to the realization that God is not dubious, but only and ever has been for us as his children with the gift of life at heart for us. John said the same thing in John 1, 12 through 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so he says that we're the first fruits of his creatures. What does that mean? Well, God's created a lot of things, hasn't he? But God is doing something through Jesus whereby he is recreating everything. He said in Revelation that all things will be made new. And he's saying that we who have trusted in Jesus, who have been born again, are the first fruits of that renewing work of God in the universe. God is erasing death. He's ending it through Jesus Christ. And he has done it in us who believe. Our Father is generous. Our Father is luminous. Our Father is unchanging. And our Father is life-giving. James has loved us by writing these words to us, by focusing and clarifying our image of who God is in this text. He's helped us to see the goal and the end point of everything, which is a life lived in faithfulness to pass into the presence of Jesus and inherit eternal life. Maybe this morning you're here and you realize you have been mistaken about who God is. You've thought that he's petty and demanding and that what he requires of you is life quenching. But now you have seen through his word that that he is riches and pleasure and life. And that what lasts is God. And that the word of God stands forever. Isaiah 47 through 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word by which we receive life and the new birth, the kind of life that lasts forever. And Jesus didn't just overlook our darkness and overlook our death. No, Jesus looked at us in our darkness and death and weakness, and he faced us all the fullness of our temptation, the fullness of our evil, the fullness of our shame and our death, and in his generosity and compassion, went to the cross as the substitute, as the victor over our darkness and death. And you and I will only make the passage out of this life into the next through death. Nothing on earth that we gather to ourselves will make any difference the only thing that will matter is whether or not we have the word Jesus and the life that he gives. If you've yet to trust Jesus as your savior, the most compassionate truth that I can share with you this morning is that you are headed to hell. But that Jesus is the way, the only way to find life. John 3.36 says, whoever believes in the son has eternal life Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Before you is the word, Jesus, and life, and riches, and security on one hand, and on the other, 
passion and desires as your impulses would have them and the death that they produce. And so I call you, dear friend, turn from death to Jesus. You may be here this morning as someone who's yet who has already trusted Jesus as Savior and you're trying to walk a faithful walk with him and yet the trials of life seem to be crushing you. The danger that we face in this life is being deceived about the kind of master we serve. We serve a good master. We serve a God whose heart is perfect who is only light and in no darkness, in him is no darkness at all. And so we see before us sometimes the pleasures of money or the pleasures of this world. We see somehow our circumstances as leading us into sin. And yet, the goodness of God is calling us to return the love that he has given to us by loving him in return with loyalty and faith and trust in who he is. You remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, how can I have eternal life? And yet the thing that led him away from Jesus was the fact that he loved riches. And when Jesus said, your riches are between you and me, he said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I love them. He did that by his actions. Just like Jesus predicted would happen in the parable of the soils where the cares of life and the deceitfulness of riches would choke out the word. But God is a God who heals people from loving riches. He's a a God who heals people from being drawn to pleasures to their death. He is a kind of God who offers his, his love and his power to secure us in faith to him. And then to lavish upon us his generosity. The unchanging goodness and generosity of God is what secures us through trials at firm to the end. It's not that we never sin again, but it's by God's power as he clarifies and sharpens our faith, even through trials, that opportunities to sin are increasingly met with contentment in God. And they find no home in our desires because we realize, no, I'm not going to leave goodness and light and love for death, for sorrow. Doug Moo said, Christian maturity is not indicated by the infrequency of temptation, but by the infrequency of succumbing to temptation. It's not wrong in that sense to have a temptation, but when our hearts are whole, the temptations won't entice us like they used to. If Christ is life and enticements lead to death and we realize that, then then the enticements stop having that glitter to us and they become to us fool's gold rather than true gold. In our culture, there's another thing, a line of thought where people believe that somehow God has made them in a way that is unchangeably oriented against what he calls them to be, calls us to be. And if we experience those temptations, we can be certain that those temptations aren't from above. But the perfect gifts of his contentment and holiness are. And so we choose Jesus. So I want to leave you with two challenging questions this morning. The first is to do an inventory of your heart and to say, to ask this question of yourself, what is it that I have believed falsely about God that makes sin enticing to me? What is it that I have believed falsely about God that makes sin enticing to me? And the second question is, who in your life needs to hear this message. Take some time to meditate on those questions. Take this question, these questions home and talk about them as a couple or with your family or with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe even if you're willing, identify those things in your conversation so that you can mark your path of obedience out loud to God. 
And then as you faithfully seek to obey this, take the message to someone who needs to hear it. Tell them of the God that you have encountered in James 1, the God who is generous, the God who is luminous, the God who is unchanging, and the God who is life-giving for eternity. Let's bow together for prayer. Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these truths that, that speak to us in a way that heals the brokenness in our hearts, that undoes the lies that we believe, that, that scatters the shadows of doubt in our souls about your goodness and your plans for us and your goals in our lives. We pray, oh God, that you would orient us from this moment forward in our lives with faithfulness towards you because we trust in your power to secure us, because we trust in your goodness lavished upon us, because we trust that you have a head for us, the crown of life, and because we see this world for what it really is, that riches and privilege and esteem are meaningless and have no value, that they are an illusion and that they are actually loss when compared to the good things that you have for us in Jesus. God, would you do that work of healing our hearts? We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.